Let's begin with uh, security issues. The Inspector General of Police, Kayo Diet Betokun, has ordered the deployment of tactical operatives and assets to ensure the prompt rescue of the kidnapped medical students in Benue State. 20 medical students of the University of Meduguri and Jaws traveling to Enugu were kidnapped along the Otupo Otupa Enugu Road on Thursday. The students were traveling for the Federation of Catholic Medical and Dental Students Annual Convention in Enugu when they were abducted. Condemning the students' abduction in a statement on Saturday by the full spokesperson, Muiwa Dejobi, the IG described the action of the criminals as reprehensive and callous. Three more deaths have been confirmed from the alleged shooting by security operatives in Zaria Kaduna State as soldiers enforcing a curfew placed by the state government during the recent End Bad Governance protests open fire on residents. New Central's investigation uh, revealed that the incident occurred in the Samaru area of the town where personnel of the Nigerian army were fingered for allegedly being complicit. News Central's Imano Bagudu reports. These residents of Gaskata Magaji wants their stories told just like that of Ismail Mohammed in the Samaru area of the town, which attracted many, including the governor of Kaduna State. They took New Central round the family homes of the young persons allegedly shot by security operatives on the same day Ismail Mohammed was allegedly killed by a soldier. <laughs> Mama got this injury, this bullet wound, from this particular bullet, from the very day, from that same day that uh, Ismail uh, Mohammed in Samaru, that we reported Ismail Mohammed in Samaru, was uh, allegedly shot by the uh, officer of the Nigerian Army. It happened that same day, and they said that uh, soldiers were shooting sporadically within the community, and then this particular straight bullet, this stray bullet, this stray bullet came in, pierced into her leg, and then, of course, it was removed. It was removed by a, a medical doctor, a surgeon in a hospital, and she's under, presently undergoing treatment. This is Yasser Abdurashid with an injured intestine, which he got from a bullet allegedly shot by security operatives. Also, on the same day, the Nigerian army confessed to have erroneously killed Ismail in Samaru. His father and the hospital management confirmed his situation. Uh, Yasser Abdul Rashid, she came yesterday night uh, with complication of gunshot referring from Usasa Hospital, St. Luke. So refer them to be complicated that you get uh, intestinal perforation due to injury. In the intestine? Yes. So you refer them, the consultant here, Amaf, she will recommend that you go for scan to confirm where the intestinal are be perforated. So the scan confirm that you get intestinal perforation. Unfortunately, Yasser didn't survive the alleged gunshot injury. His family informed News Central of his demise on Wednesday, August the 14th. Other bereaved families also gave accounts of how the security operatives allegedly killed their children. I'm with uh, Musa Mohammed, the father of uh, Mustafa Musa, who will tell us how he has lost his son as a result of uh, the enforcement of the curfew by security officers. Baba, can I again when I tell you that she must have Musa Harusu? Musa, uh, Musa, Papa Musa, soon I tell the mutton who did the shin of Hudu. Some people get a musun, she go, uh, some people caswa, skin caswa, some gum aiki, come and shat ya, Nedari. Some people get a musun, who took it a man of Sada. Sega, police, none of the vision and magaji. Could air, could air. Sesi kaharaba bendiga, sama, zama harbiyoku, seko sika arta aguje, to gudi nizasi sika dinga binsa aguje. 
har babin diga na biyu da za su shine kawai shi kuma sai ya firgita sai sun kuya tsakanin hanyar dawowa da kuma na zuwa wannan tsakanin gadan kawai sai ya fada wannan gadan Musa sake dan eh sai ya fada ciki ya fadi da gadan Musa ya so ka kasa ya fadi eh a wurin ya rasu a wurin ya Allah ya mashi rasuwa kuma sai suka ki zuwa wurin sai suna ta zagaye wurin suna ta zagaye wurin da safen ma aka ce ga mutum sai suka ki zuwa wurin aka ce ga mutum ya mutu to akwai wani dan mu anan zai je Abuja sai ga mutum haka an zagaye shi sai bude haka ganyen da ya bude ganyen sai ya ce ah ai kani na ne rana dana isiya ya rasu kaman sha da na rana na dawo na cin ma abin ba na gida amma na jin jin wannan harbi na dawo na cin ma an harbi yaron ya rasu kuma harbi bi aka yi mishi ba to kawai sai mu mun ga yanke ciki ya fadi a musani ba sai an garbe shi ne ya so biyu kani da Allah wannan bawon Allah da bi aka kashe shi in dai harbin ka aka yi ana so ka ba guri ai harbi daya za a ma kuma a kafa it is very important to state that all the accounts given by residents of Gaskiya Damagaji here in Zaria are mere allegations until proven right by relevant and appropriate authorities in Nigeria. Attempts to reach the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs via phone calls and text messages wasn't successful. However, a top-ranking military officer at the headquarters of Division 1 Nigeria Army who pleaded anonymity sent a response to New Central. His response reads, and I quote, Okay, I will share with the GOC and the commanding officer of the 11th Field Engineering Regime Battalion of Nigeria Army Zaria for their comments and responses to the videos. End of quote. With the families now calling for justice, many citizens will be hoping that the military authorities respond to these allegations. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. Very touching story there. Moving on now, human rights organization Amnesty International has alleged that more than 1,000 and bad governance, hunger and hardship protesters are being held in various prisons across the country. The organization accused the Nigerian authorities of escalating a crackdown on peaceful protesters by arraigning over 1,000 protesters in court. The protest held from August 1 to 10 took a twist and turn violent in some states, especially in the north. Some of the protesters were also seen holding the Russian flag while chanting, Tenumbu must go. The police announced it had arrested some of the sponsors of rioters who hoisted foreign flags and called for a change of government in states such as Kano, Kaduna and Zamfara, among others. Seven Polish citizens allegedly linked to the violent protests were also part of those arrested. Let's now tell you that the National Judicial Council has constituted four pro panels to investigate 27 high court judges in the country over various alleged judicial misconducts brought against them. The NJC set up the panels at its 106th meeting presided over by the outgoing Chief Justice of Nigeria, Ulukayode Ariwola. The Judicial Regulatory Body considered the report of its Preliminary Complaints Assessment Committee on 22 petitions written against 27 judicial officers of the federal and state high courts. Now, to discuss this, we will be having someone join us during the course of the news, presumably before we are done with the news to give us more perspective to this. In the meantime, we go on a short break on the news, and when we return, we'll bring you more stories. Don't go away. Nice to know you're still there. We talk health now. Top African health tech startups say partnerships with governments are key to scaling their innovations to reach 600 million people lacking essential health services. According to a new report by Salient Advisory, Nigeria is leading other African countries in health tech innovation with 29% of top startup innovators. Despite Africa having 11% of the world's population, it bears 24% of the global disease burden, with nearly half of under five deaths. With the recent MPOX outbreak and the Africa CDC's declaration of the situation as a public health emergency, it is important to take a critical look on how technology is addressing health challenges across the continent. 
Earlier on on the news, we told you that the National Judicial Council has instituted a pro panel to try 27 high court judges for alleged judicial misconduct that was brought against them. And now I'm glad to let you know that we're being joined by the Executive Director, Sterling Center for Law, DG Ajari. Uh, thank you so much, DG, for joining us on the news. Good and evening and thank you for having me. Okay, nice to know that you're there. Now, we're actually talking about um, judicial misconduct and we're referring to issues around corruption, abuse of power, or any other action that actually can be said to be against the value of justice. So I'd like to know from you what your thoughts are and if those judges are actually guilty as charged. Okay, thank you. You're calling me to uh, uh, perform functions that are way beyond my uh, pay grade, but um, so it is not within my... Uh, 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 well, by, it, by me, it's, so it's actually it is actually it's to not contextualize <laughs> and have an understanding of what these particular allegations against these um, judicial officers are, and if they're actually true. Okay. Now, first, like I said, really, it is not uh, in my place really to uh, reach a conclusion on whether the uh, uh, indicted or the i mean the judicial officers are guilty or not and um, i think that is purely within the uh, uh, powers of the njc and the njc has already set the ball rolling for investigation and discipline of erring judges now one thing i can tell you however is that in the meantime before the outcome of the probes, uh, panels are out Actions like these are very welcome, generally, for the judiciary. The judiciary in recent years has suffered a great deal of damage to its reputation. And um, it is, it, as a result of this, quite a lot of people have lost confidence in the capacity of the or capability of the judicial system to indeed do justice. Some of these uh, uh the, the damage done to the name to the, to the reputation of the judiciary arose from the conduct or other misconduct of judicial officers there are allegations of bribery there are allegations of bias there are allegations of laziness now specifically some uh, uh, allegations that are bordering on financial impropriety have led a lot of people to reach the conclusions that justice is for sale and anybody with the uh, right amount of money can purchase justice in nigeria now with these judges having been indicted based on at least prima facie cases that have been made out against them the njc is basically making a statement and telling the nigerian people that no there might be bad eggs within the judiciary but we are going to make sure that those bad eggs are rooted out they had you I mean when they are discovered if they, they are found guilty of misconduct they will be punished it is only when you have a system that creates accountability like this that is when you can indeed ask people and join the populace to develop confidence in the judicial system i like to actually understand what is actually the bane of misconduct or maybe the subversion of justice by those actually meant to uphold the law within a judicial system. Let's put Nigeria in context. Now, now let me tell you, um, a jurist once said that a corrupt judge is worse than an armed robber, an armed robber. Now, it's simple. At least when you hear that a person is an armed robber, you naturally expect that you are in danger in fact, naturally, as humans, we will take steps to prevent armed robbers from, I mean, assessing our houses, our, our properties, our assets. But then when someone is entrusted with position and authority to dispense justice, and when people feel uh, aggrieved as a result of conduct of other persons, they come before such a person expecting that a fair and balanced decision will be reached after a thorough inquiry into the facts around it. But then, when, when you now have a situation where 
such a person entrusted with this enormous power, including the powers of life and death, are able to now subvert the course of justice only for either because of uh, f- 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 financial inducement or familial relationships or some other things like that. Then you, you create a, 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 a society of criminals because what it means is that such judicial officers, is a, the judicial officer who is involved is a criminal. Persons who come before them who have committed an offense are criminals. Now, you are now also now sending a message to all those well-behaved, properly uh, con- con- conducted the, the, themselves are, uh, within the society. You are already sending a message to them that, look, it is immaterial. You can do what you want as long as you have the right amount of money to purchase now, justice. It uh, creates now, Deji, a situation. Uh, Deji, some people actually blame the system for its failings. And even um, the fact that we have an outgoing um, Chief Justice of Nigeria, Olukayode uh, Ariwola, um, who has also been blamed by Nigerians for superintending over a very corrupt judicial regime. So what's your take on that? Because people feel it is the system that has given birth to this impunity. But then I'd like to take your thoughts on that. But there is no doubt that... Um the society, uh, society generally, is inadequate in terms of, I mean, corruption, and naturally, the the, the 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 institutions that arise from the society are also products of the society. Quite expectedly, they will also uh, carry the character of the society in general. So, no doubt. But this is the problem. Each of these institutions are manned or managed by persons who ordinarily can set things aright. So, more importantly for the judiciary, when you now have a head of the judiciary who superintended over a judiciary where on for every 10 appointments that is made, at least seven or are of persons who have some familiar relationship either with the chief justice of the federation, with some justice of the Supreme Court or of the Court of Appeal, justice, judges, chief, chief judges of the various states. It already tells you that that system already is rigged. It is rigged. And so when you have persons who come into office as judicial officers, not purely on merit, but on account of the, someone who they know, then you have already started breaking the foundation of the justice system. Okay, so, so yes, without any doubt, it is the judiciary is a product of the society. So but it behoves on the person who is managing that in- institution to ensure that proper things are done. And now you may not be able to take away every corrupt event or activity or officer from the system, but you will at least be sending messages to those who are corrupt that you are indeed serious. And while I will tell you that uh, the performance of the outgoing chief justice of the federation throughout this period is. is Below, 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 below par. So However, instead of um, Deji, particular... sorry to uh, sorry to cut in, Deji. So instead of uh, probing um, twenty seven high court judges that some people feel they are being scapegoated in this case, would you rather advocate for the overhaul of the entire judicial system uh, to ensure fairness in justice administration and rebuild public trust? First. If you are not a goat, you will not be scapegoated. So the fact that somebody is being scapegoated means he is a goat. You cannot be witch hunted unless you are a witch. And so um, I think those arguments for me are, I, I would not go with them. If somebody has done something that is wrong and it is immaterial that 100 other people have gone away with it, what is most important is did you do what you have been accused of doing? What indeed does the entire judicial system need an overhaul? I quite agree. Well, first steps. One of the first steps that you must take is accountability. You must let people know that when they engage themselves in conducts that are contrary to their oaths of office, they will be taken, they will be disciplined. When you start doing that, then all your other efforts at reforming the entity system will be functional. What they mean? They are likely to be functional, to, to be effective. And so I, I, I totally disagree that um, it is wrong to, I mean, probe these 27 judges. I think this is actually the first and the appropriate steps to take. All right, Deja Jari. you want to clean up it. Uh, Deja Jari, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me this evening. You're watching New Central now. We're now going on another short break. We still have more stories to come your way. Do stay with us.
So I told you earlier on the news that about 600 million people on the continent are lacking essential health care services. But now we have um, top African health uh, tech startups uh, that are actually seeking partnership with government to scale health care services to be provided for this uh, population of people. And now to help us understand this better, I have Zila Waminaje, who is a research analyst. Zila, it's nice to have you around on the news. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Thanks for having me. So uh, how have partnerships between health tech startups and the African governments contributed to addressing the continent's health challenges? Uh, we'll pick it from there because we're looking at a deficit of about 600 million people lacking essential health services. Yeah, so um, in the course of our research on African health tech innovations, and we've been doing this work since I think four or five years now, um, when we focus on these health tech innovations, especially looking at the health supply chains, we've seen about 50 partnerships existing um, between these health tech startups and um, the government, you know. And the most common type of partnerships we see are between government and innovators who provide these order and inventory management solutions to basically ensure that people have access um, to quality medications at the hospitals, clinics, you know, and pharmacies whenever they need them. And now the question is, how are they doing that? And what they do is that they provide digital marketplace solutions where these um, healthcare providers, the clinics, and what have you, um, can provide, um, can are able to procure high quality medications from like we have a manufacturers or the distributors, you know, and also they provide them with this inventory management solution so that they are able to see, um, have visibility on their products to reduce like stock out rates at the, at the hospitals, you know, and also just to reduce waste. Um, another, I would like to say group of innovators that we see working with governments to um, improve healthcare um, services on the continent are um, these product protection and visibility innovators. What they do is that they work with both governments and manufacturers to track uh, the movement of products from like the manufacturers down to the last mile healthcare facilities. And also helping to reduce, you know, the amount of counterfeit drugs that we have in the market. And just to give you an example, like with their authentication services, you could, for example, just go to the pharmacy before you buy your drug. You see a code at the back, and then you just um, send the send the code to an um, just through SMS to a phone number just to verify that oh, this product is actually authentic and maybe has been validated by the NAVDAC. And even when we look at these underserved areas and how to reach communities, you know, that is where people are actually need this access to so like health essential healthcare services. We see innovators um, that offer a medical drone delivery services, you know, working with governments to, to ensure that um, services are able to be delivered in these communities, especially during emergencies. So there are a lot of partnerships that have been ongoing. But the major question right now that we have is, how can we foster more of these partnerships, you know, and integrate these innovations into routine public health delivery services across the continent? So how can that be done? Because um, I want to believe that there are limitations. I'd like you to first share the limitations to these innovation by these health uh, tech startups and what can be done to scale to ensure that we have a spread of these um, services to those that are in need of it. Um, one of the key challenges that comes up um, when they work with government, with um, the partnership between innovators and government is um, payment delays, you know. And um, what we do is that we'll be advocating to donors, you know, to help provide like revolving funds that can help to de risk this type of partnerships to say, help to just create this fund so that innovators have access to like working capital to actually implement their operations and then deliver services together with government. Um, also, innovators have told us that um, they struggle with like microeconomic challenges, you know, like inflation, currency depreciation. And in trying to solve for that, what they're doing now is trying to seek how to generate like um, Forex, you know, in their revenues, for example, maybe pricing their services in foreign currency where possible, or um, maybe just expanding their operations to other African markets, you know, um, that have more stable ec uh, economies, you know, just to de risk their operations. And another challenge that these innovators face is a brain drain. Um, I mean, over the past decade, you've been seeing the news of um, the migration of highly skilled professionals moving abroad. And how these 
startups are still trying to, uh, will I say, get a walk around this is like, okay, let's just optimize for talent rather than location. So they're adopting this kind of global distributed team model, you know, just to make sure that they still have these highly skilled professionals that are able to work with them to deliver the innovations. Uh, it's quite nice to see that technology is scaling all the hurdles to ensure that um, a health service delivery is provided. Uh, but then I I'd like to find out from you because we discovered that um, there is NPOX outbreak um, on the continent, more pronounced in Congo uh, as we speak. Now, um, what ways do you think that health tech um, services can be provided or can come in in today's to actually mitigate the impact um, on the continent when we're talking about major crisis and probably when, when we also talk about response time and management of um, situations like this, how do you think that health tech services can come into play? Um, yes, you're correct. Um, the NPOS outbreak just been declared a public health emergency um, of international concern. And then if you remember in 2022 when we had the COVID-19 um, pandemic, health tech innovations were definitely leveraged by the government. Um, if I want to use Nigeria, for example, we saw the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, that's the NPACDA, collaborating with um, a health tech company um, figure and they what they did was that they leveraged the company's coaching solution to um, implement their vast distribution campaigns across the country and even once that um, after the campaigns were done once we we're done with the pandemic they subsequently extended this solution you know to also even track other childhood vaccines um, delivered nationally and i think that just goes to show how effective it was in supporting the agency for them to be able to expand um to other places so that is one way um i believe that even in this mpox situation once the vaccine camp and campaigns kick off this is a potential solution that might be leveraged by the government to ensure that there's full visibility on how these vaccines are being distributed making sure they are delivered um under the right circumstances you know to make sure um they don't lose their will i say quality because they need to be stored their temperature sensitive product products you know and also we see um some health tech innovations i know like e-health africa has a lot of surveillance disease surveillance tools and they often work with them um, government agencies like the N ncdc to just help um in terms of disease surveillance data analytics and the rest of them all right um the fact that even nigeria is championing this cause makes it a win for africa because of its capacity um zila waminaji research analyst thank you so much for your time on the news thanks for having me Away from that, the queues for premium motor spirits, popularly called petrol, has continued in Abuja, Nanja, Nasarawa, Kaduna, and many other states as the federal government threatened to withdraw the operating licenses of oil marketers involved in PMS hoarding. On Saturday, long queues of vehicles were observed at various fuel stations across the federal capital territory, with many stations closed due to a lack of supply. In the Kado Axis of Abuja Municipal Area Council, some fuel stations, including AA Rano, were selling petrol at 849 naira per litre, while others remained shut. The petrol scarcity led to the frustration among motorists who spent several hours in queues to get the product. Still on fuel scarcity, Nigeria, a nation with crude oil as its major natural resource, battles with constant fuel scarcity. This contradiction has spurred several reactions as yet again Nigerians are having to queue for long hours to get fuel. New Central's Chidema Ona gives us more details in this situation as it was observed in Lagos. It's 5,000. 5,000, yeah. Yes, sir. How long do you wait for this land before you see for a buy? I don't waste like uh, two hours. The year 2024 has brought several challenges for Nigerians, especially the spiraling price of fuel and its inavailability are one of the many challenges Nigerians have had to deal with as the country faces a biting economic downturn. This reoccurring hitch of fuel scarcity has affected the daily lives of Nigerians particularly in a busy city like Lagos, where slight hiccups can cause intense traffic. In areas like Ogba, Agege and Ikeja, Lagosians are stuck in long queues with tired faces. I've been here since 5 a.m. on queue, and yet 
I didn't even hope if I can still get for it. Yeah, they sell 619. That is 619 Naira. Okay. So that's what we used to buy here. Except if they have increased it today, I have done, I didn't know because I have not been there. I did here. Around 6 o'clock, I did here, I was here. So I never buy. I'll be here since 6. 6 o'clock. That is about um, 3 or 4 hours now. Another major worry for some Lagosians are the black market fuel sellers. According to witnesses we met at several Philly stations, some pump attendants request extra cash to sell fuel to motorists and are more willing to sell to black market sellers at a higher rate of about 2,000 Naira per 50 litres jerrycan. Most of these black markets, when they buy for it, they will go and sell it in a high price. And not only that, they can even miss anything and sell for you. By so doing your fuel, your car engine will have issues. So that is one of the disadvantages of buying from black market, because I don't buy on black market. If I buy the black market now, so you cannot pay me, because I don't increase the uh, money for the transporter. So I don't increase. So that's why I don't buy the black market. Although the current fuel shortages will likely ease off, Nigerians are calling for a permanent end to the persistent scarcity as previous actions from the government have only provided temporal solutions. In Lagos for New Central, Chidima Ona. Away from that, Nigeria's federal government has been tasked to do more in ending irregular migration and human trafficking in the country. This was during a training for actors in the faith community comprising Christian and Muslim leaders in Abuja on how to offer psychosocial support to victims and help them integrate back into the society. Amadin Uyi tells us more in this report. It was a gathering of religious faithful from both Nigeria's Christian and Muslim communities. The aim of the session was to educate religious leaders on how to give psychosocial care to migrants of irregular migration that have returned back to their country. This entire training is a collaboration of the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria and all Africa Conference of Churches and it is basically focused on educating religious leaders or religious stakeholders from both the Muslims and the Christian um, perspective on psychosocial care given to return migrants and survivors of human trafficking. The core objective is to have us as religious leaders and faith actors to be uh, trained in how to provide psychosocial support to return migrants and also to survivors and again to be knowledgeable about the issue of uh, uh, migration, specifically irregular migration. You find people being taken from one state to the other in large numbers, hundreds and thousands. In the name of al Majri, that is trafficking. You find people being taken to from one state to another for labor, that's trafficking. So these things have been with us, but I'm happy that this training will give further information on the need for us to pay attention to those things that happen around us. While many believe that their experience is best told by the victims, one of them who spoke to New Central described her experience. Through what I passed through, I wasn't thinking I would stand on my feet here today and stand this strong and also be alive today, but I sit on God because the trauma wasn't easy, seriously. I faced a lot. I seriously faced a lot because the experience, the experience, seriously, the experience is really hurting. Those in attendance urge citizens and government to do more in ending irregular migration, which dehumanizes victims, is exploited by traffickers, and can be stemmed by better living conditions. My call to action for stakeholders that are here today is to go back and be catalysts that will take back the message to educate people, their adherents, 
their neighbors, people around them, and to be peer pressure to the society or to the government as well, so that we will live up to expectation in restoring the dignity of humanity and preserving and protecting humanity from being devastated by this heinous people who prey on human existence. Uh, the psychosocial support is there in the first place because there is uh, irregular migration. Now the question should be, why are people migrating irregularly? Why are they leaving their comfort zone? That's what the Africa government should look at and see how to make people comfortable. They also called on government agencies responsible for tackling trafficking to work together in a bid to achieve more results. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. New Central now continues by with uh, telling you that the ECOWAS Regional Center for Surveillance and Disease Control has reported that monkeypox continues to spread in the region with uh, 44 confirmed cases and one death recorded by the end of EPI Week 33, 2024. According to a report released on Friday, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia and Ghana are the hardest hit countries in the region. Mpox or monkeypox is a zoonotic viral disease caused by the monkeypox virus, part of the orthopox virus genus. While it shares similarities with smallpox, it is generally less severe. The virus spreads from animals to humans through direct contact with the blood, bodily fluids or lesions of infected animals. Human-to-human -human transmission occurs through respiratory droplets, contacts with infected body fluids or exposure to contaminated objects. In the meantime, the African Union Health Agency says a total of 18,737 suspected or confirmed cases of Mpox have been reported in Africa since the beginning of the year, including 1,200 cases in one week alone. The hardest hit country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the new CLAD 1B strain was first detected in September 2023 has reported 1,005 cases, that's about 222 confirmed and 783 suspected, and 24 deaths in one week. All 26 provinces in the DRC, home to some 100 million people, have reported cases. The disease, formerly known as monkeypox, was first detected in humans in the DRC in 1970. Des fois, on peut recevoir 5 malades aujourd'hui, demain, on reçoit encore 5, 10, ou même, on peut arriver même à recevoir 20 malades par jour. On essaie un peu de maîtriser la situation. Comme on est en train de voir les malades, ce sont les malades qui nous ont venus il y a, il y a à peine 2 jours. On a déjà instauré un traitement, leur prise en charge, selon les protocoles nationaux dont le traitement est encore symptomatique. Je ne sais pas si je suis en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Il est en train de me faire des choses. Now I'll tell you that Equatorial Guinea's president, Teodoro Obiang Nguema Mbasogo, has named our former bank chief, Manuel Nsua, as prime minister. This is according to a decree published nearly three weeks after the previous government resigned after being deemed ineffective. In a decree signed by Obiang, it said Nsua has been charged with the administrative coordination of Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea's 82-year-old president, Obiang, has ruled over a small African nation, a former Spanish colony rich in oil deposits, for 44 years. The United Nations and non-governmental organizations have frequently criticized repression of any form of dissent in Equatorial Guinea. Even as we continue to bring you the stories, uh, those are live 
fig, uh, pictures from Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, where thousands of people are currently out on the streets in protest against the election victory claimed by the country's leader, Nicolas Maduro, but widely rejected at home and abroad. Opposition leader Maria Corina Machado yesterday urged supporters to keep up the fight against what they describe as a fraudulent victory claim by Maduro. Machado has called the demonstrations a protest for the truth. The protests have so far claimed 25 lives with dozens injured and more than 2,400 arrested since the July 28 vote that both the president and opposition say they had won. Machado had called for fresh demonstrations in more than 300 cities in Venezuela and abroad on Saturday. The country's National Electoral Council proclaimed Maduro the winner of a third six-year term, giving him 52% of votes cast, but did not provide a detailed breakdown of the results. We bring you sports now. Serie A giants AC Milan have completed the signing of France midfielder Yusuf Fofana from Monaco. Fofana signed a contract with the Rossoneri until June 30, 2028, and seven-time European champions have reportedly agreed to pay Monaco 25 million euros to get him. The 25-year-old leaves Monaco after five years and an impressive most recent campaign in which the Principality outfit finished second in Ligue 1 behind Paris Saint-Germain. Fofana has 21 international caps and made three appearances for France at Euro 2024, scoring a penalty in Le Bleu's shootout win over Portugal in the quarterfinals. English Premier League side Liverpool started their Premier League campaign with a hard 4-2-0 win over Premier League newcomers Ipswich Town. Diogo Jota and Mohamed Salah scored the goals for the Reds as Anslaught's reign as Liverpool head coach begins. Meanwhile, at the Emirates, it took a 25th minute Kai Havertz header and Bukayo Saka 74th minute strike to put the Gunners ahead over Wolves to kickstart their Premier League campaign on a comfortable note. While at the Goodison Park, Everton, with a one-man down, lost 3-0 to Brighton. Goals from Mitoma, Milner and Adringa ensured that Brighton kept up top of the Premier League table with the win. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we look at some of our top stories again. We told you that an Inspector General of Police has deployed operatives to rescue kidnapped medical students in Nigeria. ECOWAS has raised alarm over the spread of MPOX in Africa. We also told you that Equatorial Guinea's president has named former bank chief in Sue Unswa as prime minister. Don't forget to send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. Or you can follow us on social media via at News Central TV. Watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times, channel 274, Arvo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo.